tonight, please, the book of Isaiah. It was several years ago, actually, when we started the book of Isaiah, and then, I don't know, half a year ago or so, we picked it up again in Isaiah 45, and we're all the way to Isaiah 62 tonight. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah, so we're almost there, uh, but I, I think it's important. I love Wednesday nights just digging into parts of the Bible that maybe we're not as familiar with. Uh, I think it's a good, important balance in the Christian life. And so uh, Isaiah 62, we're going to repeat a lot of themes that we've seen over the last several weeks because these themes are just there. And again, I, I, I don't want to tire. I'm not tired of saying them. I hope you do, don't get tired of being reminded of the same truths. Um, and just a reminder that the big key in prophecy is not a modern-day nation called Israel. The big key in prophecy is Jesus Christ, that everything centers on and points to Jesus Christ, and things are fulfilled through him. And so that, that clears up so much when it comes to Scripture if you'll just get that settled in your heart and your mind. And I, I mean, there's just so many ways we can see it throughout the Bible. I mean, hundreds, literally hundreds of verses about it. And so uh, it it's, doesn't have to be confusing if we understand these things are fulfilled in Christ. And let's look last week. We saw in Isaiah 61. Let's look at this again. Uh, this is a fairly popular passage. It's fairly well known. Jesus stood up in the synagogue and he read this verse and he stopped at a certain point, as I studied, we studied last week, uh, because he was there to bring salvation. He was there as the Messiah, presenting himself as the Messiah, as the Christ. And uh, he stopped right before he read about the day of vengeance. Remember, the day of vengeance is coming. The Bible says there will be tribulation for God's people. There will be uh, difficulty in this world, but God's not missing any of that. He's not batting an eye. He, he's not winking at it, I should say. Uh, he notices all of it, and when Jesus comes in the air for us, he will then pour out his wrath upon this earth. And when he pours out this wrath, right, when he pours out his wrath upon this earth, uh, then the Bible says that uh, it's going to be a, just a time of uh, great trouble, a time of great pain and suffering for this world as Satan is leading the charge and as Antichrist is leading the charge. And so again, when we read Isaiah 61, realize there's a lot of things in these few verses. It's talking about when Christ came the first time, when he's coming again, when he rules and reigns the millennium, and then it looks even further beyond the millennium to uh, a time with the Lord forever. So look at Isaiah 61, verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And by the way, that verse, verse 3, it, it makes an amazing sermon just applying those truths that God can take your mourning and he can turn it into joy. He can take your heaviness and turn it into a spirit of praise. He can take uh, your sin even and turn you into someone who's declared righteous. So verse 3 is an amazing thing. Uh, but verse 4 says, They shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Again, understand very, very simply, how is this fulfilled? We've seen it over and over and over again. It's fulfilled through Christ. It's fulfilled through everyone who is in Jesus Christ. Uh, ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. Verse 9, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. We've seen this. How, what seed is that? It's Jesus Christ. It's everyone who's in Jesus Christ. So, again, I'm not going to reprove that tonight, but we're going to see some very familiar, uh, similar topics again tonight as we just continue on into Isaiah 62. Notice Isaiah 62, verse 1. It says, For Zion's sake, now what is Zion? It's Jerusalem. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp 
that burneth. Heavenly Father, please help us to understand your word clearly. Help us not to be deceived by false teachings regarding end times, regarding Zion, Jerusalem. Help us to see what your word teaches and just accept it for what it is. And Lord, I pray that you'll teach us something tonight. And again, as always, pray, please help us to yield to you, whatever you show to us tonight. Uh, help us to leave here, Lord, more committed Christians, better Christians than when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, for Zion's sake, he said, will I not hold my peace? And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. So again, questions, did this happen? When Jews returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt Jerusalem after their captivity, did, is verse 1 the fulfillment? Is that the fulfillment uh, of what we read, verse 1? No. What about the modern day nation of Israel? Does that fulfill what we read in verse number 1? No. And as a matter of fact, Jerusalem, uh, during the reign of the Antichrist, and scripturally, the Bible calls it Sodom and Egypt. When is this going to be fulfilled? It's going to be fulfilled, it's going to occur when King Jesus rules and reigns. Who is the righteousness of Zion? There's, it's, Zion is not a righteous place in and of itself. Who is the righteousness of Zion? It's Jesus. Who is the salvation of Zion? It's Jesus again. We're going to see that here in a little while at the end of the chapter. In fact, just, just look at verse 11. It says, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him. Notice the salvation is a person. And who is it? It's Jesus Christ. Now, uh, again, who is the righteousness? Who's the salvation? Verse 2, who's the glory of Zion and of Jerusalem? It's Jesus. He is the glory. He is uh, the salvation and the righteousness. Now notice verse 2. It says, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name. So again, verse 1, he's speaking of Zion, Jerusalem. He says, Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Well, here in Isaiah 62, it doesn't tell us about a new name for Jerusalem, but there is a new name coming for Jerusalem. It, it's not that much different from the first name, but let's go look at it. Look at Revelation chapter 3. What's this new name? Well, long term, there is a new city, and there's a new name. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. And again, these prophecies, they hearken to the future when this will be fulfilled through Christ and through the perfection that will be in Jesus Christ. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. We are part of the building of Christ, as the Bible says. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Do you notice what the city of his God is? New Jerusalem. And then notice... Uh, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. So we, we know this, the history of the Jerusalem that's in the Middle East right now. In fact, that city is going to be used by the Antichrist and burned. It's going to be attacked. It's going to be destroyed to some degree. It's going to be remade when Jesus rules and reigns. But folks, again, understand this old earth, this, the old heaven, the old earth, it's going to be done away with. There'll be a brand new heaven. There'll be a brand new earth. So again, what's the fulfillment of Isaiah 62? It's pointing ahead to the new Jerusalem. Uh, we've looked at this, but go to Revelation 21 just to see it again. Revelation 21, 1 and 2, it mentions the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21, it says, And I saw a new heaven. Verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. The first heaven, the first earth, Satan has been in both of those. There's been corruption in both of them. But the new heaven and new earth, there'll be no sin. There'll be no corruption. There'll be no curse. There'll be no, no death. Notice, the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Look down at verse 23. And the city, New Jerusalem, had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb, Jesus, is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved, notice that, shall walk in the light of it. So understand, there's a physical, there are physical nations, and there's still going to be nations, but there is one nation that rules the world. What is it? It's the Israel of God under King Jesus. 
So notice again, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Verse 24, we're not talking about the millennium here. We're talking about past the millennial reign of Christ. We're talking about when there's a new heaven, there's a new earth, there's no more death, no more sin, no more corruption. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And then go back to Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah and look at chapter 60. Verses 18 through 22, we saw this briefly when we looked at Isaiah 60. Look at Isaiah 60, verse 18 through 22. It says, violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Now, the beginning of chapter 60, much of it is referring to the millennial kingdom. But as we read these verses, understand this is beyond the millennial kingdom. This is when there's a new heaven, there's a new earth. Notice, violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise so this new city the walls are literally called salvation the gates are called praise verse 19 the sun shall be no more thy light by day neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee but the lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy god thy glory thy sun shall no more go down neither shall thy moon withdraw itself for the lord shall be thine everlasting light and the days of thy mourning shall be ended Thy people also shall be all righteous. How are the people going to be all righteous? Because, again, this is believers in eternity with the Lord. They shall inherit the land forever. I thought we're in heaven forever. Remember, there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. Say, which one are we going to be in? I believe we're going to be in both. New heaven, new earth. Right here, he says, they shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified a little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. What small nation? What small one becomes a strong nation? God's people, the Israel of God, believers from every physical nation. Look now again, Isaiah 62, look at verse 3. Uh, he, Isaiah 62, verse 2, he said, Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Verse 3, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem. In the hand of thy God. Can I remind us again? We won't look at it again. We've seen it multiple times recently. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10 says that we are a kingdom of priests. That we rule and reign. We are kings and priests with Christ. Revelation says that over and over again. Here, verse 3. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. And a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Verse 4. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hef Ziba. What does that mean? It means my delight is in her, or delight. God delights in this land. And thy land, Beulah. What does that mean? It means married. So instead of forsaken, what is the land? Hef Ziba, delight. God delights in this people and in this land. Desolate. No, no longer desolate. Beulah or married. For the Lord delighteth in thee and... Thy land shall be married, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. The point is, this Jerusalem will never be forsaken. This Jerusalem will never be trodden down. How is that fulfilled? Again, look ahead to the new Jerusalem. Verse 6, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord... Keep not silence. So again, we're talking about a new Jerusalem whose walls are literally called what? They're called salvation. That, that's what the walls are literally called. What's the name of this city? New Jerusalem. And he said, I've set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, whose walls are salvation. Uh, and what are they supposed to do? Notice, they're not to hold their peace day nor night. Remember what Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Unto salvation. The new Jerusalem, the walls are called what? Salvation. He said, I, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. For, by the way, for what physical nations? For all physical nations. So here, verse 6, who are these watchmen? I believe this is the church. These are God's people. What are we to do? We're not to keep silence. We're not to keep it to ourselves. We're to preach the gospel, but not only to preach. Look at verse 7. We're to pray. Notice verse 7 says, And give him, God, no rest till he establish and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. We've studied this before. 
The Bible says in Psalm, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Now, is that a command? Are we to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Yes, we are. All right, now hold on. What does this not mean, first of all? Well, let me explain. What's the fulfillment of this? One thing we're told to pray every day. We're, with the, the model prayer, that's a, to be a daily structure of prayer, right? That's why he says, give us this day our daily bread. You should structure your prayer to the Lord based on that model prayer, among other things, among other prayer. But one of the things we're to pray every day is what? Thy kingdom come. When will there be peace in Jerusalem? I mean real peace. Uh, will it be when we get the right guy in the White House to broker a deal? Is that when there's going to be peace in Jerusalem? Is it when we send enough missiles and bombs and money to the Middle East? Look, again, I'm for protecting our friends and those who would like to destroy us. I'm for standing up and protecting our nation. I'm all for that. But what I'm saying is, is that how this is fulfilled? Are we going to have a lasting peace when we get the right guy in office? No. Are we going to get a lasting peace when the Antichrist rules and reigns from Jerusalem? No. When are we going to have a lasting peace in Jerusalem? When Jesus Christ rules and reigns in Jerusalem. So what are we actually praying for when we're saying, Lord, give peace to Jerusalem? What are we really doing? We're, we're doing the same thing John did. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Uh, thy kingdom come. That's really what we're praying for when we're praying for peace in Jerusalem. So not only are we to be preaching the gospel as God's people, but we are to be praying daily, give, verse 7, him, God, no rest till he establish and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And folks, that is not going to happen until Jesus Christ rules and reigns. So again, what are we praying for? We're praying for Christ's rule and reign. We're praying for the kingdom of God. And this reminds us of something. Verse 7 reminds us of an important prayer promise. And I want you to think of it this way. Reflective prayer is effective prayer. What does that mean? It means when I read what God's word says and I reflect the same promises back to God, he's given me light from his word and I take the light he's given me in his word and I reflect it back to him and I remind him of the things he has said. That's how I can know I'm going to get my prayers answered. Uh, the Bible says it this way in 1 John 5, 14. It says, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything, According to his will, he heareth us. Now, how do I know what is God's will? Somebody tell me. How will I know something is God's will? If it's in God's word. If it's in God's word, I know it's God's will. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him. So how can I be effective in my prayer life? I can be effective by first knowing what God's will is from his word. If I know what his will is and I ask according to his will, is he going to hear me? He is going to hear me. If he hears me, am I going to have the things I've asked for from him? Yes, I am. So sometimes people say, God doesn't answer my prayer. Well, are you praying according to the will of God? Or do you look at God like he's this genie who's just there waiting to take your order? You know, oh, hey, God, here's what I want. Here's the order I've put in. And I've, I've had people tell me that in prayer. It's almost like th these, these phony churches that say, you know, you speak your own reality. You just speak it into ex existence, and that's how you get what you want from God. That's not how you get what you want from God. What you do is you learn to want what God wants. You learn to desire the same things God desires. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That literally means he'll put the right desires in your heart. And if he puts the right desires in your heart and you ask him for those things, will he answer? Yes, he will. If we ask according to his will, he will hear us. Is it God's will for there to be peace in Jerusalem? It, it is God's will. And what are we really praying for when we're praying for that? We're praying for Jesus Christ to rule and reign. So again, uh, he says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And when you pray, remind God of his promises. I mean, quote scripture back to God. That, that, that's what he loves. He wants, us to, he wants us to try him. Remember in Malachi, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. He wants you to put him to the test. He wants you to claim his promises in prayer, asking him based on his word. So pray. Now notice verse 8 and 9. Uh, when the Lord rules and reigns, as we've seen before, other places, there'll be great prosperity There'll be great peace, and there'll be praise 
offered to God. Verse 8, the Lord hath sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies. And the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine for the which thou hast labored, but they that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Again, he's looking past the trouble that Israel and Judah are facing presently, and he's saying there's a day coming, you're not going to have any of those troubles. Imagine that, a promise that there's a day coming, you're not going to have any enemies. You're going to have nothing but peace. You're going to have nothing but prosperity. You're going to have nothing but praise to God. Well, that is exactly what will happen with Christ ruling and reigning. Now, verse 10, he says, Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, Cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Now notice this. He's saying to the daughter of Zion, Thy salvation cometh, but he's declaring this to the end of the world. He wants everyone to hear this. Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward cometh is with him and his work before him. This salvation is a person. And who is it? It's Jesus Christ. Uh, look at Zechariah 9.9. 9. Keep your finger here. Go to Zechariah, the second from the last book in the Old Testament. Um, a little different prophecy, but very similar verbiage. Look at Zechariah 9, verse 9. And we'll turn to the fulfillment of this. Look at Zechariah 9.9. 9. says, Rejoice greatly, <clears throat> O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, how is this fulfilled? Well, we know Matthew 21. Let's go Matthew 21. What we've called the triumphal entry of Jesus. Look at Matthew 21. Verses 1 through 5, it says, When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Zechariah, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. I'm simply trying to build the case again that what Isaiah 62 is referring to is pointing ahead to Jesus Christ. It's not pointing to a modern day nation called Israel. It's pointing ahead to Jesus Christ. Continue on in Matthew 21. I wish we had more time to read this, but... Basically, the, the leaders of the physical nation of Israel, they come to question Jesus. They come to, they don't believe Jesus. They don't. And look at Matthew 21, verse uh, 35, or 33. He said, hear another parable. And in fact, if you look at uh, before that, he's already told them a parable. He's already basically said, you don't believe me. You didn't believe John. Uh, but we are the, I am the one that you should be looking for. Verse 33, he says, here another parable. He's speaking to the political and religious leaders of the physical nation of Israel. He said, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. And know the picture here. The picture is of God starting the physical nation of Israel. Did God choose the physical nation of Israel? Yes, he did. But why did he choose the physical nation of Israel? Was it because they were great and righteous and holy? No, he just chose. He laid his love upon them, and what was his purpose for choosing a physical nation in the first place? His purpose was to bring forth a Savior for the whole world. Now notice, Jesus speaking to the religious leaders of that physical nation, notice he says, verse 33, a certain householders planted a vineyard, hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and led it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew nigh, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. And if you know what he's talking about, he's talking about the prophets here. Verse 36, again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. Now, who is that, obviously? Jesus Christ. 
saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They, the religious and political leaders, say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures? And then he's going to quote, The stone which the builders rejected, you builders, did you know I'm the stone, I'm the cornerstone, you've rejected me. That's what Jesus is saying. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting from Psalm 118. And then he, makes, he draws a conclusion after he's quoted that. He said, therefore, say I unto you, physical leaders of Israel, political leaders of Israel, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. What nation is this? We've seen it over and over and over and over. It's the Israel of God. It's the spiritual Israel. People say, wait a minute, but you're talking spiritually. Yes, exactly. They say, well, I'm talking about a literal nation. So am I. I'm talking about that we are literally a spiritual nation. That's what we are. We're the Israel of God Spiritually and literally, we're the nation, the Israel of God, the nation to whom he gave this stewardship. Notice, given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. They attack this stone, they'll be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Who's the stone? It's Jesus Christ. They're, they're going to, look, they're going to, there's going to be tribulation. There's going to be trouble for God's people. God's word teaches that. There's going to be a time of great tribulation, but there's going to be a time God's going to pour out his wrath, and Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, will rule and reign literally from this earth for a thousand years, but then also there'll be a time of perfection throughout eternity with the Lord. But notice verse 45, when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Well, he certainly was speaking of them. Uh, look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22. And look at verse number 7. Revelation 22, verse number 7. What we read in Isaiah 62, verse 11, it says again, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Well, who's our salvation in? Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. The new Jerusalem the walls are literally called what? Salvation. And, and notice again, the foundation of the New Jerusalem, all these different tribes. What does that mean? So that's just Israel. Exactly. We are Israel. We are Israel. We are the Israel of God. We, it's a spiritual nation. Now notice, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. In Revelation 22, verse 7 Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Look at verse 12. He says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. By the way, if you doubt, is Jesus Almighty God? Go compare Revelation 1 to what Jesus just said. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. He's Almighty God. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Who is the root of the tree called the nation of Israel? Who's the root? It's Jesus Christ. It's, it's not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the root because it's not a physical nation. It's a spiritual nation. He's the root. He's the offspring of David. If we are believers in Christ, we're Abraham's seed. We're part of the Israel of God. We're that holy nation. We're that peculiar people. We're the elect. We're the saints. All those things the Bible says. Notice verse 16. I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star and the spirit and the bride. That's 
All believers say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. Who are we saying come to? To Jesus. And whosoever will, Reformed theologians need to understand what that means. I don't think we have any of them in here. I'm just saying that if anybody happens to hear it later. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life, and I love this word, freely. Jesus paid it all, and it's free for all who will come to him. Go back to Isaiah and look at Isaiah 40, verse 10. Isaiah 40, we're almost done with our study tonight. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Notice, behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. And his work before him. What did the Bible just call Jesus? He's the Lord God. That's who he is. Look at verse 11. He shall feed his flock. The great shepherd of the sheep shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Well, let's finish Isaiah 62. Again, verse 11, he says, Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Verse 12, and they shall call them the holy people. Who are the holy people? The elect, believers of every nation. We've seen it over and over and over and over and over. Unless you just want to deny the Bible, you can't deny it. We are the elect. We are the holy nation. God's people, believers of every physical nation. He says, they shall call them the holy people. Who is that? Believers. The redeemed of the Lord. Who's that? How many of you are redeemed how you love to proclaim it? There we go. We're the redeemed. What does it mean? We're bought back. And, and by the way, say, no, 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 it's the physical nation of Israel. Okay, hold on. Again, there's just so much proof. You just have to deny the proof of Scripture. You, you, you have to be listening to fables and, and, and you know, preachers instead of what God's Word actually says to draw that conclusion. But notice, he says, the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Well, who are the redeemed of the Lord? Well, the Bible says, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to the Lamb of God, Jesus. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of, listen to this, every kindred. And tongue, and people, and nation. Every physical nation. There are believers from every physical nation who are the redeemed, the saved, the Israel of God. Notice, people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Stop and think about that for a minute. Christ, the king of the Israel of God, Rules and reigns forever. Who reigns with him? These people right here. Every believer from every nation. Again, this, this is so plain. God's word's really plain about this. And the reason we keep studying is because it keeps appearing over and over throughout this book, especially. We have four more chapters to go. Next week we'll see in Isaiah 63, it, it harkens back again to the time not only when Christ rules and reigns, but it'll mention the time when he comes with judgment, when he comes with vengeance, when he comes to do battle, do war. That's Christ. And we'll see that next week in Isaiah 63. Let's bow our heads together, please. Heavenly Father, help us just to believe your word. Um, Lord, your word is so plain about this. It's so amazing to realize we are your people. We, we are the Israel of God through faith in Christ. There are so many blessings, so many promises you've given us. We don't deserve any of them. We are, you've made us joint heirs with Christ, joint heirs with the Messiah, the King, the Anointed One. Thank you for that. Now bless us as we go our separate ways. Lord, as we pray, I pray that you'll hear us. Lord, we bring all these requests to you tonight because without you we can do nothing. And you've told us to come to you boldly for mercy and grace. So Lord, bless us as we pray, as we get ready to go our separate ways tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet, please. We'll sing and be dismissed. All right, in our hymn books, please, page number 650. 650, we'll do the first and last verse of Redeemed. Proclaim it loudly tonight, Redeemed, page uh, six, what is it, 650? Is that right? Excuse me. 650, yes. Sorry, I can't read my own writing. 650, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it.